Mark 10, verse 6 through verse 9. This is page 1562. Jesus says, But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Dear beloved, if we were to purchase for ourselves a car, it makes plain sense to us to look at the car manual to figure out how this thing works. If something's starting to go wrong, we should open the manual book or talk to a mechanic who knows that manual book inside and out so that we can have things made right. And that basic principle applies to marriage as well. It makes a lot of sense to go to the one who designed marriage to get our marriage advice. And not just advice, but instruction, our understanding. Here's what marriage is about. Here's the purpose of marriage. And here's how marriage works and ought to work. And so, beloved, with that in mind, imagine you had the opportunity to ask Jesus, Jesus, who is that all-wise counselor, that perfect designer, God in the flesh, if you were to ask him, Jesus, can you give me a little marriage advice? What do you think Jesus would say? I mean, wouldn't it be great if he spoke to things like this, something so practical, something so relevant, something that seems so nitty-gritty in the inner workings of our everyday. And yet, when we turn to Scripture, that's exactly what we find. We find the designer, the all-wise counselor, God in the flesh, the expert on everything, speaking to us, even about something like marriage. And what we find here in Mark 10 is exactly Jesus addressing questions uh, like that. Uh, Mark 10, just to give us a little bit of context, there was this great debate going on, and it wasn't easy to answer. Uh, everyone at that time seemed to have an opinion on things, but these opinions seemed to be somewhat shallow. Uh, they weren't really rooted in something solid. The Pharisees knew this, and so they thought, well, this is perfect. There's not really a clear answer on the question and on the debate that we're having. And so let's go to Jesus and get him caught in a tangle. That's their ultimate goal here in Mark 10. Notice that in verse 2. The text says they came to Jesus testing him. And that's why they asked this question then. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now, we're not going to, it's not the purpose of our sermon here to answer that question, but I want you to notice with me Jesus' method for looking for answers. Watch what he does as he gives an answer to the Pharisees. Jesus says, let's not root our opinions in something shallow. Let's root our opinions in Scripture, God's Word, the, the handbook of the designer himself. So you see that in verse 3? What did Moses command you? And already we need to pause here and just note Christ's assumptions. Jesus doesn't say, what did Mo Moses write? But he makes it much more personal. Speaking to those who lived hundreds and even over a thousand years after Moses write, uh, wrote Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, a thousand years later, Jesus looks at them and said, what did Moses command you? 
And, and so you notice there's something personal here. This is uh, Christ's way of, of turning the question back on them and saying, this is not just a theore theoretical exercise. This is something that you need to deal with. Either you're obeying or disobeying the command of Moses. And the Bible, of course, though written here in this instance, these passages written, uh, the ones that Jesus is referring to, written by Moses, they're written by men, yet it is the living and active word of God. And beloved, that's one of the first things we're noting as we walk with Jesus to find answers. The word of God is God's word. It is living and active, and it is relevant to you and to I, just as it was for the Pharisees. They are accountable to obey this word. And so Jesus says, what did Moses command you? And then they give their answer. You see that in verse 4? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dim dismiss her. Now, the Pharisees here, they were reading their Bible. They were reading Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. And as they were reading that passage, they were concluding, Moses permits divorce. And in their eyes, this permission was not just a concession, but it was a permission of blessing, you might say. That's how they were interpreting Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. They were interpreting it this way. Uh, your wife starts to displease you. She's not living up to your expectations. Then here, Deuteronomy 24, is God's stamp of approval through Moses that you can discard of her. You can dismiss her. That's how the Pharisees were interpreting God's word. They had turned Deuteronomy 24 into a get-out-of-jail-free card for the unhappy husband. Now, culturally, in that day, that made a lot of sense. In the pagan ancient world, a world in which the Pharisees were steeped through the Greek and Roman influence, a woman, a wife, had little to no rights. And so she's not making you happy. The world said, cast her out and get a new one. And the Pharisees thought that God was saying the same thing in Deuteronomy 24. And so here's the problem. It's not that the word of God isn't clear on this issue. Jesus actually again points the light back on the Pharisees. And look at how he responds in verse 5. He says, the problem is their heart. Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. And so here's Christ's interpretation of Deuteronomy 24. It's not God's free endorsement of divorce, but it's God's realism about their sinful hearts. God knows that they would be prone to quickly cast their wife aside. And so in his kindness for the wife's benefit, who is treated as little to nothing in that society, he added these restrictions to regulate divorce. He knew they were going to go ahead with it. And so God says, let's protect the wives who were prone to be neglected. And so Deuteronomy 24 was given. Again, our, we're not seeking to answer the divorce question and where are there exceptions to that rule in Scripture this, this afternoon. But here's what we're looking to do. Notice what Jesus does next. Because how can we guard ourselves from being like the Pharisees? How can we guard ourselves from reading our own preferences into a text? As the Pharisees, they had the word of God, Deuteronomy 24, and yet there they were reading what they wanted to read into that text. Great, God says I can divorce my wife. Here we go. Well, look at to Jesus again. He helps us, verse 6. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Notice Jesus is quoting scripture here. In fact, he's, he's quoting the scripture we read, Genesis chapter 1. And in doing so, Jesus is modeling for us how to read the Bible. Here's the principle. Interpret scripture with scripture. And let the clear statements of scripture help inform and understand your or inform your interpretation and understanding of the more challenging portions of scripture 
Because as we wrestle over God's word, though there are deep and challenging passages, there is one coherent whole. Now, that intro is important to remind us of our foundations for life. It's God's word. It's trustworthy. and We're accountable to it to follow God's teaching. But let's go one step further and make a more direct point for marriage. Where can I go to find help and direction for understanding marriage? Again, if Jesus was in front of us, where would he turn us to? Well, notice, he says the best place to learn the basics is to go back to the beginning. Verse 6, again, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And so do you hear what Jesus is saying? Here is, here's the point we're making. Do you want a foundation for your understanding of marriage? First, yes, go to the word of God. But Jesus crystallizes that further and says, then go to the beginning. Go and look at the good design because there you see my blueprints for what I designed marriage to be. And I can't overemphasize this. So often we are looking for some how-tos when Jesus is often saying we need to dig deeper and lay a foundation. If the foundation is wrong, the whole building will crumble. And so it's not an exaggeration, dear congregation, that this afternoon every marriage problem and conflict would be helped, not necessarily cured, but every marriage problem and conflict would be helped by remembering and living out these foundational truths. This is relevant. That's what Christ is saying. Do you want help for answering your or questions about marriage, for understanding what marriage is meant to be? Go back to the beginning. There Jesus has spoken on the issue. There he's taught us what marriage is meant to look like. And so, beloved, our title for this afternoon is The Foundations of Marriage. And as we look here at Genesis chapter 1, there's three foundations we want to spend a few moments looking at. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28 our title is The Foundations of Marriage. We have three points. Our first point, dignity. First point, dignity. Now, dear children, Genesis 1, as we read it, uh, it tells us of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the good creator, making all things in six days. And you heard that word that was repeated six times from verses 1 through 25, and it was that word good. And it was good, and it was good, and it was good. All that God made was good, reminding us that he himself is the supremely good God, and all of his creation is an overflow of his goodness. But then as we were reading, maybe you noticed that there was something very special that happens in this chapter. God doesn't just speak light into existence or the next thing into existence, but there comes a point where suddenly we hear God speaking Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to one another. And you see that in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so here is the triune God, not just speaking forth creation, but pausing before this climactic moment to, to have, as it were, this conversation in the Godhead saying, let us. Make man in our image. And then verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And if we were to keep reading, Genesis 2 explains how the relational triune God formed dust of the earth 
into a man and then breathed his holy breath into that dust in order to give him life. And children, we know that this first man was called Adam. And then the woman, Eve, is made by God from Adam's side. And this special creation, humanity, is made then to be in a special relationship with the glorious God. Now, beloved, this is something we've heard before. And yet, try not to lose the shock of this. Because what Jesus is pointing us back to is an astounding foundation for our understanding of not only marriage, but of humanity. It's so valuable and it's so countercultural. Uh, there's no other vision of humanity quite like this. Wherever you find things to read, whether you're reading things from 3,500 years ago when God spoke this to Moses, you won't find a vision of humanity like this in those writings. Or if you look to 2,000 years ago to the writings of the Romans and the Greeks, you won't find a vision of humanity like this. Or if you turn to the books of 200 years ago and anything since, to Darwin, you won't find a glorious vision of humanity like the one we have here that Jesus calls our attention to. You won't find a robust, dignified view of humanity in any other system. Either we denigrate humanity, saying we're only dust, as many scientists today say, we're just stardust. Close. That's half the equation. Or, on the other hand, we deify humanity and make ourselves God. And yet here, the Bible shows us that the truth is altogether different. The truth is that God is God alone, but he made humanity in his image, giving them this inherent dignity. And beloved, this is astounding. Again, just pause to reflect on what this says about you and every other person around you. Every male and every female share the equal dignity of being made in the image of God. It doesn't matter how young or how old you are. You don't grow into or out of the image of God. It doesn't matter how strong or how weak you are. Your dignity is not found in your strength or your speed or your skill. It doesn't matter how light or dark your skin is. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female. Each person is made in the image of God. That is revolutionary teaching. And it's the first great truth that we must receive from Jesus as a foundation stone for every human relationship, including marriage. Because when it's grasped and applied, what a beautiful, healthy relationship can be built on this one stone. Now, there's many applications we can make, but let me just give you the one big, obvious, overarching one. It's this. This truth must change the way you see others. It must. If I want to have my mind renewed by the word of God, then this truth is running as a filter through which I'm now called to see every other human being. So that means if I'm a young person and I'm interested in dating someone, the person I'm drawn to is an image bearer, not just an isolated thing with no accountability to God or anything else. No, they're an image bearer of God. And the person I'm married to, if I'm married, is someone who's been given a dignity by God himself. That means I can't just look at them or treat them the way I want. God and what he says about us must shape our thoughts. Now, beloved, in the first sermon of this series, remember how Jesus gave us a text, which was to be like a sharp knife to help us cut out the idols of our hearts? Well, now here's the one who has 
who is the creator, he's saying, go back to the good beginning and see me, the creator, God, giving Adam and Eve as a good gift to one another. And so here's the general principle Jesus wants us to get. It's this, don't receive your spouse as a God, but receive them as a gift from God with thanksgiving. And what what that does to a marriage, whether a new marriage or an old marriage, when we grasp that one principle, they're not God, but they are a gift from God to be received with, with thanksgiving. And so, dear married friend, have you been receiving your spouse as a gift from God? This week? Every marriage, even healthy ones, will go through ups and downs. And there will be times where things are going well, where it feels like your spouse is a gift and it's easy to be grateful. But then there'll be other seasons where they don't feel like a gift. Maybe you've been in a time of conflict or drifted apart. And so here you are and you find yourself maybe um, locked in a cage of bitterness between you and your spouse. And each day or week as it passes, another bar is just placed in the windows of your prison of bitterness. Well, one surprising key that can begin to open up that prison of bitterness is prayer. Our first responsibility is our own heart. And so start praying this way, Father, help me to receive my spouse as a gift. And pray that maybe for a week. And and then you might be surprised to notice that you start praying, thank you, Father, for my spouse who is a gift. And over time to start communicating that to your spouse through your actions and to your words. And so there's one application for us that's derived from this basic truth that we're all familiar with. Am I treating my spouse, looking at them as an image bearer? who is not God, but who is a gift given from the hands of God. And so do my actions to my spouse communicate appreciation for them as a gift? Am I treating my spouse with the dignity that they deserve as an image bearer of God? These are are sharp questions that as we reflect on them, they certainly start to reveal our heart level attitudes and our actions and maybe expose them. But what a valuable foundation to build on as you weather the storms of conflict and hard conversations and patches of dryness in the marriage. Here's a foundation stone, Christ is saying. Image bearer. But let me add a clarification here. We live in a Genesis 3 world of sin and the curse. And it's possible if someone is struggling with an abusive spouse to be finding their view of God just further distorted by hearing this fact that I'm supposed to be seeing this person who's inflicting harm upon me, I'm supposed to see them as a gift from God? Is that really what God wants me to hear if I'm in that situation? Well, dear friend, if you are in an abusive relationship, that is a horribly painful place to be, and the application is very different. It's actually this, God wants you to know that you are made in his image, and therefore, it's not okay that someone is treating you as less than. God is actually saying to your spouse, how can you brazenly hurt and abuse one who bears my stamp upon them? And he's saying to you, get help, get help. It isn't right, it isn't okay, I hate abuse. I am a city of refuge for the oppressed, and my people ought to be a city of refuge as well. And so get help. And yet here is the foundation uh, stone number one, this idea of dignity as image bearers and living with a God-honoring respect for my spouse. But there's a second uh, foundation here. Notice it's that of distinction. 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 Uh, Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
Now, for centuries, there was no question about this, but in the past few years, things have changed. Um, we aren't so sure anymore about this whole distinction idea. Just two weeks ago, I was reading a slogan with a picture of blobs on it that were representing people, and it, the slogan said this, we're all the same, we're all different. As if to say, we're all humans, we're all the same, but after that, we all can, I guess, decide, because we're all different. There's just humanity, and then there's difference. That's it. And it's each individual person determining their own difference. Now, that may sound like freedom to some, but it does open up a Pandora's box of anxiety and confusion that our world is also recognizing as we have our young people attempting to figure out who they are, a boy, a girl, or any other sort of thing, even an animal. Freedom is found as we come back to the foundations. Our good creator tells us the truth about ourselves. All humanity, all humans have dignity being made in his image. But notice there is a crucial distinction that's woven into God's creation of humanity. Men and women are different. God made them differently. This is a good distinction that we are to learn to embrace. Now, again, we live post Genesis 3 and we're not implying that's that that there's no one out there who really struggles with these things. We're not saying that. We even expect that living in a Genesis 3 world. So there are real depressing struggles in this area. But the solution is to embrace what God says, to go back to the foundations and then to use our maleness and our femaleness in his service to care for the creation he has given to us. Now, again, this isn't just uh, a needed cultural comment. This is a comment that's foundational, foundational for every marriage. Uh, men and women are different, and if you don't believe it, then get married, and you will discover it. Men and women are different, not only physically different, but mentally, emotionally, chemically different, wired differently, designed differently. Males have more testosterone if we're just looking at the biology and therefore are usually bigger, stronger, and have more aggressive tendencies. Women are generally more in tune emotionally and relationally. The one is not better or worse. Both reflect God's good image, but they are different. The question for us is, well, how can I, if I'm a man, channel my strength for productive rather than destructive purposes? Just saying I'm different than a woman and that I'm stronger or something like that isn't a free pass to go and use my strength to tear down. Channeled wrongly, men can be vicious and damaging. Channeled rightly. Men can be valuable providers and protectors. How can a woman channel their emotional and relational intuition? Channeled wrongly, women can be sowing seeds of discord, gossip, overly critical, reading into situations. Channeled rightly, women can use this seemingly sixth sense to nurture and care and cultivate relationships so that they bear fruit. These are good gifts. They're different gifts. And they're called to be used in God's service. Now, in your marriage, you can be frustrated about your spouse's differences. Uh, you can be against their differences, wishing they were more like you. And so much counseling actually starts there. It's my spouse, my spouse, my spouse, my spouse. And then they're saying, my spouse, my spouse, my spouse, my spouse. Notice the Lord, we'll find out this over and over again. The Lord is saying, you deal with your heart. And yes, there will be a time probably to, to address your spouse and, and work through that. But let's start with us. And so we can be against each other as we notice our differences, you know, locked in one house together, with living with a different person. It can be a challenge. Or we can say, Lord, help us to embrace our differences for the good of our team. 
And so that's the question of application. How can we work together using our differences in a way that complements each other rather than competes against each other? The Lord is setting out this family vision where maleness and femaleness in their differences are to be used in his service for the good of the team. And so that's the goal. How can we work together for God's glory in our home, in our family, in our church, and in our community? Yes, acknowledge the differences. But here's the other application. It's this, to live with understanding. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, calls the husband in particular to live with understanding towards your wife. And yet the wife also needs to live with understanding towards her husband. Um, just to illustrate this, it took some years. I, I'm a slow learner, so it took some years for me to notice that I am more adventurous uh, of a spirit, you might say, more going outwards into this world type of spirit, and Sarah's more of the homebody, enjoying the safety and security of the home. And that's a pretty standard stereotype that has some truth to it often. Not always, but often the guy is usually more, let, let's go out, as it were, and the wife is, let's stay home. And it was, yeah, at least five years into our marriage before Sarah kindly said to me, why do we always have to go so far on our dates? Or why are the family trips so far from home? Couldn't we just stay home and, and have an adventure here? And that's a little thing, but there were frustrations brooding underneath that from not recognizing the differences. I thought I was loving the family by saying, let's plan that day trip at the beach an hour away instead of staying close to home. And so understanding the differences, living with understanding towards one another goes a long way. We are different, male and female, and that's by design. Finally, there's one other foundation stone here, and that is devotion. Devotion. Uh, notice verse 28. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, we'll come back to this in a future service uh, sermon, but notice that God here is blessing Adam and Eve after he has joined them together. And that's the language of Christ. God has joined them together. There is this oneness. The two are made one. There's a foundation, this, this knitting together that, that God himself has joined. Yes, the husband and wife exchanged the vows on their wedding day, but God is there to join that couple together to make them one flesh, one family unit. And then here in these verses, God is blessing them. God is giving them dominion. God is giving them a purpose. And this is really what I'm highlighting here, is that this one new family unit is actually not, first of all, devoted to each other. They are, but they're first to live in devotion to God as his image bearers and as those who've been gifted dominion over creation. And so that's the devotion we're talking about. As a married couple, we are to be devoted to the Lord as we are devoted to one another. And so here's a, a practical application then. Again, the first person I am called to give an account to, whether I'm the husband or the wife, the first person I'm called to give an account to is the Lord. He's the king, and he's set us up as kings and queens over his creation. Yes, I'm accountable to my wife, being married to her. But my first accountability, the first line of defense is accountability to the Lord. Uh, when my wife's eyes don't see me, his eyes do. Accountability starts there. Devoted to the Lord, we're called to be set apart to serve him. And so what's this mean? Well, it means living 
depending upon him as a husband and wife. Notice in this good creation, Adam and Eve are made, and they're not made to have an independent existence from their creator. They're made to live receiving the creator's good gifts, living in fellowship with the creator, walking with him, being devoted together to the Lord, depending upon him. And then having dominion, having exercising this dominion of cultivating God's good creation, not as rebellious tyrants, but as faithful stewards. And so in our homes, in our workplaces, wherever the Lord has placed us, seeking to cultivate the lives of those under our sphere of influence. Well, beloved, we are made then to depend on God, to delight in God, and to be devoted to him. That's our whole life. If I'm single, that's my life. If I'm married... This is what Jesus is saying. Here is your vision for marriage. It's it's a marriage that's rooted in the design of the creator, devoted to the creator, depending upon the creator, delighting in the creator. That all leads us then to our closing word, and it's this. It's that good word of repentance. Repentance. Here's the design. And every married person, if their ears are open, can spot ways in which they've deviated from the good design. And that's why we need Jesus, the creator, to be speaking to us. Jesus, the savior, the one who's in the business of recreating the one who's in the business of extending forgiveness and power to help us kill our sin and learn to go to our spouse and to ask, to confess our sin, to ask for forgiveness and to seek their help in change, in changing the way that we live with them. And so beloved, I end this sermon with that word, repentance before the Lord and to one another really do take time this week to reflect in light of the good foundations Jesus has here, to say, where where are we? Where have we deviated? And how can we, through Christ, come back to him and come back together? May the Lord help us. Amen.